and he's going to be um, presenting and taking questions on his paper, Shared Business Services Outsourcing, Progress at Work or Work in Progress. Okay, um, can I stand here? Yeah, do, yeah. do you need me? <laughs> well, that's fine. Okay. I've, I've put a couple of quotations on the um, slide that um, really reflect what it is that's happening uh, when people are talking about shared services. And these two you may be familiar with, but one of them, the first one comes from a CBI document that they produced within, I think, about two uh, weeks of the Conservative coalition election victory in 2010. And uh, it's clear from that that you know, they think that if you take services that have been provided by public organisations but aren't specifically seen to be front line, as it's called, then you can somehow shade them away. You can deal with them. Of course, they recognise they might be contentious amongst the staff. The second um, uh, document is more directly related to uh, shared services in uh, higher education. Because this is a document produced by the Policy Exchange um, think tank which was, of course, founded by two Tory current ministers back in 2002. It claims to be independent. In practice, it's entirely made up of uh, conservative uh, thinkers. Um, and what they do is, in this piece here, which is clearly extremely attractive to any university finance director or, or senior manager who is interested in saving money, they say that actually you can save as much as 30% if a model of transferring work that is being done in-house to outsourced um, uh, suppliers is carried out. Now this is the thinking that in a sense is behind the idea of um, uh, shared service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so what is outsourcing? What is, what is the way in which they, they want to take um, uh, this kind of work and make those kind of so-called savings? First of all, obviously outsourcing can be physically removing work from a particular locality. Um, but in the public services, it usually represents work being carried out on the premises of the um, original provider. So outsourcing most people think, oh, well, it's taking it to China, or it's taking it somewhere else. No, no. Outsourcing, when it refers to the public services, usually involves people from another company working, using the space provided, the buildings provided, the um, economic infrastructure provided by uh, the initial uh, uh, organisation, and indeed by public purse. So, um, what does it involve? It involves really shifting added value from some people who are adding value to the value adding process conducted by a private company, usually a private company, not always, sometimes outsourcing can be to another public organisation, but essentially it's about shifting value added activities. Now, of course within the term value added, what it means is, I mean we've got an example here, value added, right, a colleague came up, sorted out the machine, that was value being added to the process of actually teaching, educating, being involved in a higher education institution. So what you're then doing is saying, well actually, this work here that we saw in front of us, right, is now going to be carried out by somebody who is working for a private supplier, a separate organization whose business, clearly, is about making profit. So then the issue is, well what happens to that value? Where does that, where's the cut? in that particular value take place? Does it all go to the worker who does the work, or is some of it being taken in rent, in profit, by the organisation that is now the private supplier, owner of the labour power of this particular individual? Now, indeed, in the, in the work, in the research that, that, that I've been primarily looking at, it's been around the issues of outsourcing and subcontracting. And although it's, it's a fairly kind of technical debate, um, one of the things that is worth bearing in mind is that there is a sort of a difference that you can detect between outsourcing and subcontracting. Subcontracting tends to be about a more temporary shift 
in work. You need to get something done, so you subcontract it to somebody who's then going to be involved in the process of uh, painting a, a, a wall. Right? You don't normally you know, paint walls yourself, therefore you subcontract that painting of the wall out. That's the kind of, no, it's a temporary process, it's got a fixed duration usually. Outsourcing is something different. Outsourcing is, shape, is reshaping your organisation. You have an organisation which is like this, and outsourcing, you're taking bits of it, and you're putting those bits into another form of organisation. So, the pretty picture I referred to at the beginning <laughs> is here, really. You can't see it that well, actually. But anyway, but on the, le on, the, on the left of the screen, you've got um, this picture of um, a, an integrated organisation with um, non-core support services, with uh, core activities, local managers, and senior management. In a sense, a, a, a run, a controlled process that works amongst them. Now, it can work well, it can work badly. I mean, if you have poor management, then actually this process and the, and the services provided are not usually very effective. If you have better management, if the thing is working well, then you have a very effective organisation. The model in the middle here suggests, well, look, let's take the, um, a number of these different services and let's outsource them. But of course, how then do you integrate that outsourcing into the core activities of the organisation. Well, you have to have managers of outsourcing companies. So, from a situation where, for example, you might be talking to an individual directly and saying, look, uh, can you sort this out for me? <laughs> right, and go back to our, our image here. Rather than do that, you'd say, well, actually, um, I need to call your manager and ask you, if it, ask him or her, if it's possible that they take over this work of sorting out this particular machine. In other words, there's a process that is added, that is external to the organisation. Of course, at the moment, you might still have to do that. You might have to ask somebody to come and reorganise your machine to do so on and so forth. I mean, this is other way things happen, but it's internal. And the internal manager knows what your business is about, knows the way in which you're working, knows you packed personally. There are debts that pass back over time. There's knowledge that goes back over time. I mean, it's quite, it's quite interesting just, just to jump out of this for a moment. One of my colleagues today was telling me that she's a, she is a, uh, has a bank account in Ulster Bank. Ulster Bank is owned by NatWest, is owned by RBS. Right? She has now not been able to get any money out of her bank account. Right? And I explained to my, my son, my son works in IT locally, and he said, yeah, of course, well, you know what they did? They got rid of all of their uh, standard core IT staff who had memory and knowledge and background of how things operate, right? And they brought in consultants. They effectively um, outsourced in this kind of way a whole series of support activities Right? And clearly, in that process, when you have complexity beneath it, knowledge, human capacity to store knowledge and experience is actually um, shrunk. It disappears when you bring in other people. They don't have that background. Some of them may have been there for part of the time, but most of them haven't. They're new. And that notion of, of making a break that is then dependent upon the relationship between the managers right, and what remains of the core activities and local managers and senior managers, that, that break is something that becomes quite complex and quite difficult to manage. And indeed, it's one of the reasons, as we'll see in a moment, why the promises of cost savings and so forth and quality improvements are bogus. Don't actually, there isn't evidence to support that argument. So, in the middle here, you have like, the, 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 a, sort of, the, 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 a, a temporary stage. Right? And then, of course, you can move on. And this, of course, is one of the most important points to make within a higher education institution. That is that once you start the process of outsourcing, you know, if you did believe that that is the way to conduct your business, then why not have um, social science a company running your social science teaching? Why not have your uh, IT uh, uh, teaching being done by outsourced teaching companies, your law school being run by a private law company, 
And effectively, you move to a situation, as many companies have done, where effectively they are in the, in, in, in the manufacturing of products, where they are simply assembling pieces of material that have been constructed right, by other people, by outsourced companies. Now, that process is one that, that needs to be reflected on, because actually, if something goes wrong with this, it's very rare that senior managers will say, oh, we need to go back to that. Rather, what they do is they say, oh, we haven't gone far enough. Right? In order now to secure the benefits we really wish to see, we need to proceed to move to this particular model. Now, what about shared services? Because I was, I was really gobsmacked by um, uh, the exchange that I saw between um, uh, one of the colleagues, I think the Van Schexter here, or some, somebody, and the, and the um, thoughts of the day uh, where, um, on the university website. Yeah, where, it, was, where, it was me <laughs> trying to get the notice for this meeting on the message of the day. Yeah, that was a, uh, that's right. And, 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 look, and, and that, what they said was, well, we don't mind putting up the notice, but you are not allowed to say shared services outsourcing because shared services is not outsourcing. I thought, well, I mean, first of all, as you quite rightly correct, it's my title of my working paper, which I'm going to be submitting for publication. So, in a way, there is kind of, you know, somebody there hasn't really thought it all through, because you try and change the title of an academic's paper, you are interfering with academic freedom. There's no question about that. But, I mean, let's not make who, this is somebody who doesn't, you know, like a lot of the HR people, they don't really know they're from one part of the academic to another. But, but, the reality is that shared services is about outsourcing. It is about outsourcing. And we need to look at the kind of ways, first of all, in which it can operate in a non-profit way. And some of these have, have been um, uh, illustrated in, in, in some of the literature. For example, um, government imposed service is a shared service. UCAS is a shared service. You, lots of different universities use it. No great particular problem about that. Joint lobbying. Universities UK, other organisations lobby together. Well, you know, that, that's classic. That's no, there's, no, there's no issue about that. Sharing locally owned facilities and the M25 consortium of academic libraries. Well, the academic libraries are there. They decide, OK, what we'll do is we'll allow all our, all our different students to use the other, the other, the other libraries. I mean, this is, this is sensible uh, use of facilities. Bulk buying. If you are in the same business, and you want to buy desks or you want to buy computers or anything else, then share your, by all means, share your purchasing power to do things. Now, this is shared services, but not outsourcing. I quite concede that. But, so what is shared services outsourcing? Well, in essence, I mean, there are four different ways in which it can operate. Um, one way is in relationship to university-owned housing. And there are some examples of this around the country where different universities in, a, um, in the same area, like Manchester, for example, have set up a company owned 100% by the universities to provide student accommodation across the whole range of, uh, of, of, uh, of universities. Tends to imply and remember about this, that you have some sort of a hierarchy or non-competitive relationship. Because obviously, if you're trying to attract students, particularly in the present era, you want to be able to show glossy accommodation that you provide to your students. Right? So, um, and if you're a, a university that's got that glossy accommodation, you might think, well, I don't, and, and you're in competition with another local university, and you don't want that university to attract students on the same basis as yours, you're not going to go down the line of having shared company running your, your student housing. You'll keep your accommodation separate. But, you know, in a whole number of areas, there isn't direct competition. I think it's like Manchester, which has got a big university and a polytechnic, now a new university, you know, the competition between them is not very great. So what you do is you can have shared services. That isn't, that isn't an issue. But just remember, that's 100% university owned. Then you have mixed ownership. And this is a situation where you can have 50-50 or 60-40 of a joint 
ownership of a company. And um, this is delivering to a service to one or more higher education establishments. So, for example, um, a company is set up which is part owned by the university, part owned by a private company. And that organisation then um, is, uh, let's say, not by one university, by several universities, the part owners of that organisation. Now, that shared service right, can be uh, a shared service of, uh, let's think, it can be, um, let's think examples that have, that have dropped out of my head for a moment, there aren't very many of them. Um, example can be a, um, a medical <coughs> service, Right, where students have a, there's a, uh, a provision for students to have um, access to some sort of medical care. Um, it can be a, uh, a gym. It can be, and there's a number of different ways in which, you know, different kinds of services can be offered to more than one organisation uh, on, that, on that shared basis. Where um, clearly you're dealing with a situation where if you're delivering a service, you're within proximity of other uh, other universities in the, in the same area, and where there is an interest. I mean, actually, I suppose a classic example might be somebody, if you decided to run your um, uh, catering in a joint owned with a private caterer, right? I mean, there are lots of little ways in which, in which that sort of model could be, could be, could be used to suggest um, uh, that there's a possibility for having um, a joint ownership between university and private companies. The third area is wholly private. Now this is, it, it, it happens everywhere. I mean if you think about, um, we've got uh, the caterers in this business, in, 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 in you know, university here, but which have been huge complaints over, over the years since they've been established. But you have a whole range of different ways in which Catering can be uh, supplying several different universities. It's doing a service. Um, it's a, it's a hundred percent uh, privately owned, um, and it lives to one or more. And then the final category in this kind of you know classification of different forms of shared services is where you have a hundred percent private ownership, delivering a bespoke service to effectively to one university. But it only becomes a shared service when it's also delivering to another. And it has to be either another university, but actually, particularly in the last six months, I mean nine months with the increasing amount of competition between universities, this is less and less likely. Uh, for example, you could have marketing. You could have a marketing function, which is 100% um, uh, uh, privately owned, which is bought in because they're really good marketers, because they will undercut the cost of running it in-house. You have a whole range of different ways with that, and yet you're delivering to one university because two universities, nobody wants to share the same marketing company, right, in order to provide marketing. On the other hand, on the other hand, that company may also be providing marketing to a local authority, somebody who's not in the same competition. Now, at the point at which it is then delivering to this other local authority, technically, it can fall under the title of shared services. Because this is a company that is providing services to more than one public organisation. And um, we can talk about the, um, the VAT implications of that if we want. But look, here's another pretty picture, which, which is basically suggesting the range of um, shared services, running from publicly owned... Right, to, you know, on, on on the left of this screen, through to a mixed provision of private and publicly owned to privately owned entirely. So the description could be in-house, joint venture, partnership, and totally outsourced. The models of outsourcing and shared services are driven by those quotations that I started. Uh, to talk about, which is cost savings, number one cost savings. And the claim right, is that private companies can reorganise right, and reduce costs and save you a lot of money. Now how they do it, of course, 
is through reducing the cost of new staff. I mean, up until now, they've been tupid. Now, of course, the question whether tupid will survive um, is under some kind of question. But traditionally, the way in which they've done this is by reducing costs for new staff. So wages often, but not always, because actually very frequently local labour costs are, are shaped by expectations, not by the management. So where they can change the, the actual um, benefits, it's, it often is a great deal easier. So they have fewer holidays, they have lower pensions and so on. Anyway, the arguments are that the, the, the claim is that this leads to 20 to 30 percent cost savings. Now, in fact, the evidence doesn't show this. I mean, I've done a huge trawl of the evidence, of all the evidence of the reports on, 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 out, on the, on the benefit costs and benefits of, of outsourcing. And there is no clear evidence. First of all, staff costs, there is evidence that staff costs can be reduced. Right, that's clear. There's a piece of evidence to say that's the case. But it's also, the profits are substantial. So what about the costs to the principal organisation, the organisation that is saying, I want outsourcing or I want shared services? Actually, there isn't evidence. Um, there's one quite amazing report done by Deloitte, the consulting firm, in 2005, which actually says, no, don't do it. Basically, it says, look, this fad, this trend moving towards outsourcing doesn't produce the benefits. The reason it doesn't is about the role of those middle managers that I put in, into the, the private company managers in the middle of, the, of, the, of that um, middle, middle square. What happens is that by putting a row of managers, by inserting a row of managers into the process of, of external managers, into the process of managing your business, you shift bargaining power to them. You shift bargaining power to the private company. The consequence of shifting bargaining power to the private company, the private company, after one year, says to the principal, hmm, well, things haven't gone as well as we wanted. Um, you're going to have to give us more money. If not, we walk away, leaving your business in tatters. Right? Bargaining power shifts from the central organisation to the organisations that you've brought in to actually conduct work that's a critical part of your value added. Now, the argument initially goes, oh, it's not a critical part of our value added. And then you think, what's the, di what's the difference? Right? If you're trying to attract people on the, on the, on, effectively on the, uh, on the high street to come in and buy London Met Limited or whatever university it is, right, what you're saying is that every part of your business is a, is a part of the front line. If you work well... If you can get equipment that works after two minutes, so rather than having to wait two hours or move to another classroom, right? You know, if, if you have that kind of quality response, then actually you show the people that you're delivering what you're supposed to be delivering, and people are ready to go for it. But if you don't have that, if you have a process of, of, of uh, 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 an introduction in the middle that doesn't deliver the service you want, then you don't get it. So. Bargaining power shifts those people because they say, oh, we need more people. Or they say, oh, we need to do things differently. Or we need more space. Or we need a different set of, um, uh, of computers to work with, which you provide, not us. We're, we're, we're the people who are organizing this for you. We're not actually delivering the hardware. I mean, the, 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 the most surprising thing I have found in this whole looking at the sort of the... the, the shared services argument is that if you, if you want to make money and the, all the evidence shows that outsourcing is a much better way of making money than creating your own business. If you set your own business up, you expect a business return somewhere between 5 and 10% over the first two or three years. If you buy an outsourced uh, function, you're immediately into 20%, 25%. Because you don't have the capital investment necessary. You don't have to build the buildings. You don't have to build the environment in which you... All you have to do is have your labour power in there, right? And ensure that the difference between the amount you're charging and the cost of your labour is that 25%. That's all you have to do. And then you say, look, actually, we're going to have to pull people out of this because it's not very profitable. And then... You know, the magic, oh, but we, you can't do that. Oh, well, put in a little bit more money in that way. The bargaining power is very, very considerable 
in, the, in, 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 in that process. And this is why it's found by both the Deloitte Consulting paper and the more recent Danish review, of, which has looked at every single piece of written work that's been done since 2000, looking at the costs and benefits of outsourcing. And they both find that there's no clear evidence of cost savings. There are, however, three reports. I mean, Policy Exchange just bottles somebody else's. Uh, CBI bottles again the same report. K KPMG, which is a very, very influential one, um, all of them refer to the Australian Industry Commission of 1996. And so you go back to this, which was done, if you remember, there was a very kind of right-wing government in Australia um, uh, in, in, in the early 1990s. And there's, there was then, they organized this commission. And essentially, what it's saying, I mean, first of all, the evidence base is, is really quite, quite thin, particularly when you look at the um, international studies that they looked at. But nonetheless, this is where you get that figure. I mean, these are quotes here, right? Savings range from 10 to 30% in over half of the services studied. Well, okay, over half of the services studied, but what about the other 40% or 50%? They didn't fall within those parameters of 10 to 30%. So you see how, how selectively that term 10 to 30% is picked from here, it's re-quoted again and again and again. And when you look at that second point, Right? which they themselves, can, you know, in, this is a direct quote from the same Industrial uh, Australian Industry Commission, where they say that actually very few have attempted to assess all the relevant costs. For example, the cost of having an in-house external management right, means you have to have somebody who then manages the internal, uh, so the external managers. So actually, you have got, you, you, it costs you to have these people. It costs you to go through the exercise that's been gone through here, for example, to have six months of people in meetings talking to um, various shirts from, from, from different organisations. I mean, this is a cost that is not included in the costs where, where, where they're making these estimates. So then, of course, the, the second point, a second issue, the changes in service levels are not taken into account. So, and, 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 and the thing that has to be explained, that this commission report, I mean, it looked at something like 75 different cases. Almost all of them were about um, bin delivery, dustbin delivery. And this is, you know, this, is, this was the big area that moved. So you're dealing with a, a, an area, this is the evidence of the 10 to 30%, where you've got in a sense, a separate activity, a distinct and a fairly discrete activity, it isn't an activity chain, isn't a whole series of activities um, within local councils, but is basically a discrete activity that, you know, at the margin could presumably be run more efficiently by some managers rather than others, but it isn't, it isn't the basis of evidence to then say that, come on, come on, universities in the UK make your 10 to 30 percent savings by adopting th this method. A more recent um, study uh, may make some of these, these, these points. That early research on outsourcing, which was largely about the outsourcing of um, specific services from local authorities, um, identified a link between contracting out and cost savings. Today the evidence is seen as mixed. And it goes on, there's now considerable dispute not only whether savings are made, but also, if they are, what is the sources of the savings and are they maintained? In other words, there is evidence to suggest that initial savings, where there have been evidence, diminish over two to three years. Then there's the question of where are they made? What are the services, what are the savings made from? Right? Are they made from the act of bringing in an external company or are they made from the job of actually taking a piece of work or uh, seriously and trying to actually resolve the problems that you've got in a serious way. And that's a big, a big issue um, because it leads directly to the question of does outsourcing improve quality? Remember, we are now in a situation where for our university to survive, we have to have the highest quality that we possibly can, right? And that's what we're all working for. 
but does outsourcing improve quality? First of all, the government report from, for, 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 the, for, for, for the ministry actually referred to the dearth of material in 2007 that deals with this. Nonetheless, it went on, it said that we've got very little material, nonetheless, because this was a, a commitment, this was a belief that they had, under the right conditions, competition and contestability secure better performance. That raises an issue, well, what are the right conditions? Right, so we need to think about that in just a moment. The evidence that they, that they gave, right, uh, that they referred to for this statement was that included that this, that this argument that local government officers <coughs> did not actually carry out retrospective analyses of the comparative costs. In other words, they introduced outsourcing and they didn't look back later and make any assessment or comparison about what had happened in their organisation compared to what had happened in organisations that had not outsourced. Because, one, you know, you think, I mean, you think today, the, I mean, let's go back to the bins. The bin lorries today are different than they were five years ago. I mean, I was staggered the other day. I mean, they were throwing into a green lorry and they were throwing everything into it. Right? You know, I mean, all, all our kind of careful sorting out this, that and the other. And they were just pushing it all in. Because, right, down the line, the technologies make it possible for them to sort much better than I could ever, ever do. Now, that notion of making a comparison over time to see what happens, right, and then comparing with other people, simply not done. Simply not done, and, and, as, as, as that particular piece of report uh, uh, evidence. And then, of course, they did this huge um, national survey of local authority officers. And the incredible thing, really quite staggering, is that only 39% of the respondents believed that um, increased competition would lead to improved efficiency. The idea that, that you have competition coming in to run your business can somehow make it better, right? isn't believe, isn't something that the people who've been involved in it actually believes the case. So, another argument on the question of quality, I mean, this, this is obviously well known, but I mean, the, the, whole, the whole hospital cleaning situation, where, um, you know, it is totally clear, it recognised now, that by outsourcing cleaning, what you did was, al was allow disease to come into your organisation. Right? That is that the, the, the difference, I mean I can remember once talking to one of the people I interviewed was the um, international manager of the Accor hotel chain who said um, that their policy in France, having extended everywhere else, was to get rid of um, subcontracting or outsourced um, room cleaners. Why? Because they had found out that if you use in-house people, your beds and your linen last an extra one month right, per, per nine, right, in other words, they take more care of them, staff who are working with them take more, on a regular basis, take more care than somebody who's just coming in and then getting out again, now that, that kind of, you know, I mean, at one level it's intuitive if that's the case, you know in your own house you do that yourself, you take more care of stuff than, 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 than you would do, you were just kind of spending one night there and went one night somewhere else, this is the logic of, of, of uh, Davis's uh, findings. So what are the right conditions that might improve performance? And again, this is referred to in, in those um, reports. First of all, cultural conditions. Transparency, high trust, involvement of the staff, collective bargaining in good faith. No loss of entitlement to no two-tier workforce. I mean, you've got a whole series of things that, that, that they actually, if you have all of these things going on, then just maybe outsourcing might improve your performance. This is, this is under the right conditions. Of course, what are the business conditions? Well, the business conditions I've just referred to, the high degree of separation of task. In other words, you can have a, if you can have a separately defined task, I mean, you think about security. Right? Does it make any difference to you if you go into a place and somebody snarls at you? Right? Or if somebody's cheerful and friendly. You know, I mean, it, immediately you begin to say, well, actually, commitment to an organization 
commitment to a sense of what, what you are doing does make a difference. So even if you take a task like that at the front house, at the front gate of, of, a, of a university, you're immediately having an impact on the rest. We, we, we are in a complex organisation. Universities are complex places. They are not places where sing, a single task can be separated out that make, if you like, no difference to everybody else. Everything is integrated. And it's clear that the more integrated a business is, the less outsourcing works. So, both outsourcing and shared outsourcing, right, give power to external providers. This is a critical... Because the power is shared, it is actually unlikely to lead to cost improvements. It's unlikely to do anything for quality, indeed, the reverse. What it is likely to do is to lead to worsening terms for the newly employed workers, and eventually, in time, for all workers involved. Okay, I think that's, yeah, that's it. I'll leave you my last picture for maybe later on. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, has anybody got any questions? Who's driving the whole thing in higher education? Because often I find that a lot of you know, the initiatives that uh, you know, happen, they're not you know, local initiatives. It's you know, coming down from, I, I don't know where it is, you know, higher education academy or HEFKE or somewhere. Is that you know, the situation here? Well, I, I think you have to look. You really have to look, first of all, at, at what happened under, under Labour. Because... It, it is clear that those reports, those government reports, that push towards um, outsourcing in the public sector had begun under the earlier Major and, and Thatcher governments, but it was really pushed very hard by, by the Labour government, attempting, I guess, to try and reduce the cost of the public sector within the overall sort of macroeconomic um, uh, environment but actually very, very, in my view, misguided. And they were sort of encouraging a number of those positive reports. Now, that I think, I hope, um, that they, they appreciate is, was, was a significant mistake on, the, on their part. I think that's where it began. But if you think back, we're dealing with, um, I mean, I, I, I was at a um, PhD jury in, in France last week. And um, there, the, the student was comparing student finance in the UK with student finance in France, and um, how the, you know, um, basically how students sort of survived in the two countries. And actually, the, there are huge parallels. The pressure to what what we what we could call to 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 put a student's sort of education into the marketplace. Right, has been high in both countries. Now, in France, for a range of reasons, it's been resisted much, much more strongly than, than it has in the UK, largely through mass mobilisation and, and, uh, and, and, and so on. But it, it's also, it, it, you know, that, that pressure to, to say that everything that can be commodified, should be, has been dominated that Labour government. And, I mean, the, you know, if you think about it, I mean, the, the, the introduction of student fees, that occurred under Labour. Right? And, you know, so, so this, this other process, it seems to me, is, is a part. Now, of course, the Conservatives immediately leap on that, treble the student fees, make everything worse, and, and then the, the CBI and, and the, you know, the employers and, and the rest come in behind. But the, but the issue is, if, that, if they get away with all of this, why not start paying for secondary education? I mean, I mean, why, why, why draw the line at, at over the age of 18? Why not? Why not? You know, and, and, and you know, I mean, a number of schools have already gone considerable distances in outsourcing. You know, why, why not? Why not produce that model, right, through all the public services that we are, that we're used to? And I think we have to say that 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 you know, part of the, um, the events of the last two days demonstrate precisely why this should not take place. That is, that is, that is public uh, morality, public um, good, right, uh, should be identified 
with uh, the kind of values that say, no, we don't let greed and, and, and private individualism um, and money talk. So hopefully, I mean, you know, you know the, the Labour Party has, has understood some of this. Uh, the Conservatives, I think, unlikely to, unless they're, they're shown by people that, that, that what they're proposing is unacceptable. So in that, in that sense, do you take this much more as a, it's an ideological attack in terms of well, basically dismantling as far as possible a lot of the public services that we have in order to you know, raise a new little agenda really in terms of privatisation or what have you, rather than from their specific point of view of actually being cost effective? Because I'm not quite sure how much they believe their own propaganda. Because I think actually it's not that difficult to destroy the rationale that they use to market it. But they can get more out of it by the very fact of breaking up at a much more sort of out with an individual university. But actually looking at it in, in its totality, because what you're doing then is you're weakening the labour force, you're weakening, you know, you're, you're, you're giving them the ability to actually move things around a lot easier. And I think there's a lot more of that behind it. See, what's interesting, what Gillies often says when we talk about shared services, it's not outsourcing. It's not outs and the argument I've always used, because obviously, as you see here, we represent the members of staff in more than just one university. And you say, okay, well, if, even if London Met is suddenly going to be, those staff are going to be the private company, who are they then going to do the work for? Because we suddenly, we become the outsourcer of somebody else. And you can... But... It, it, you know, like you put on before, looking at policy exchange and looking at all of those, it's always been about basically dismantling as far as possible the state. And I think there's much more of that behind it. Yeah, I think if you look, if you look at the, uh, the Conservatives' kind of policy agenda in education, and this is why I you know, raised the issue of paying for secondary education, it does seem to me that Gove and the rest of them in encouraging sort of, you know, academic... Uh, what they call them, academies and, and the separation, the breakdown of local education authorities, um, all, of, all of that process is about trying to create sort of the notion of isolated educational areas. And, and what you're doing is you're moving into um, an area which, which largely, I mean, has, you know, all of us go to school, all of us spend years and years in this. If only you can get in there and make a profit. You know, it's a bit like you know, the opening of the Chinese market. You know, well, if you only even get into China and make a profit, right? Here, you've got millions of people around who, are at the moment, just having their lives dictated by public policy makers. So I think I think there is, you know, the sense of saying if you roll back the state, if you roll it, if you if, you know, if you trample it out of areas that, that have been traditionally, I say traditionally. I mean, it's not that long a tradition. I mean, we're talking. We're talking only from the 1880s, 1870s and 1880s, at the point at which there began to be a serious um, workers' movement arguing for genuine democracy. And I, I think these things are linked. That is, that the, the, the agenda which says that it's only about if you've got the money that can you get the good things, that that, that is a profoundly anti-democratic agenda. Whereas what, what, what has been established and has worked um, you know, not always well, and not certainly as well as we would like, but which has worked, has been the, the, the democratic agenda of saying that people um, are actually important and that, and, that, and that their lives should be seen as something that can be better provided for if you work collectively than if, if people are left individually in, in face of, of, you know, the challenges that, that, that we all have. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> well, I totally agree with that, but they don't. And that's the trouble. And in a sense, not holding this meeting here is great, but it should, in a sense, be in the boardroom with the governorship. Um, but they don't want to do that because they don't want to hear this argument. But actually, if they heard the argument about state on one side and um, private on the other side, they'd have no problem. Because that um, kind of divides what they've decided on, and they're on the private side in that context. The word that um, Gillis loads, is the word public, because he doesn't understand it. And it's an ambiguous kind of word from his perspective. Because it actually um, m means um, good, public good. 
And the only time I've seen him actually squirm was, was when I said, well, look, if this, you have shared services or any other form of kind of outsourcing, it doesn't really matter. Um, the point is that um, essentially somebody's going to take something out of what is an organization that's dedicated to the public good. It's the basis on which, of course, legally it's constituted as a company limited by guarantee. But it's also a basis on which it's understood generally within the public domain, which is larger than simply the state in that sort of context. Now, he can't hit that. And his friends can't really hit that because the notion of, oh, it's the, for, for, for the public benefit is one that they don't want to get in that debate, they don't want to engage in. Because they know, they know that this clearly isn't for the public benefit. Outsourcing isn't, um, shared servicing, which is just a, a euphemism for outsourcing, isn't either. Um, but we need to get them onto that ground of, dis of ground of discussion. Because there are some people who are in the middle, and there are some people who are the governors, who are in the middle in terms of that understanding and that rhetoric. And if it's presented to them like that, as in, you know, basically, it's um, fr frankly old men with lots of money kind of sort of um, using their money to, to get more money um, at the expense of young of young people. If you put it like that, um, actually, it's pretty effective as a, as a, as a tactic. Can I just come along just straight after that? Yeah. Is that right? I mean, the argument that they've got, to put it in context of what they're actually saying at London Met, and I just, I mean, I, I found that helpful to sort of look at the global picture, so thanks for that. But what they're saying here is, it's not about making profit, even though it's a 500 million pound contract for one of these three companies, Wipro, BT, or Capital, have got their hands almost on the 500 million pound contract. There isn't anywhere else in the sector where there's been such a large contract procurement exercise through the OG notice in Europe. It's, it, it is <coughs> unprecedented. And they're saying, but it's not profit, it's not private profit, it will be a management fee. Right? And that's their oh, yeah. get out. Yeah, and that means they are VAT exempt. <laughs> right? And that fee might be fixed, but it might also be going up or down depending on how well you're doing, but yeah. it's not profit, yeah. because that would mean we've got to pay VAT, and that would cost us 20%, and this is their trick, their new trick, which is not being picked up on. The Tory government are bringing a new bill, the finance bill that comes into law this summer, to say you can do that as long as you don't make a private profit out of it, which is, you're right, you're right. and bowlers friends in the city, he probably sent his condolences card to Bob Diamond earlier. <laughs> because he did work with precisely these same people ten years ago. So this is their trick, this is the additional savings that they're being dangled by Osborne. It's the 20% VAT exemption, which isn't... Okay, so that's all I wanted to put. So the question, and how much has this has been looked at for you, is, is this the new trick, is the VAT exemption? Because those private companies... Compass or Mighty or whoever does your, your cleaning or your ISS, mm. these they have to pay a bit of extra tax. These people are being given the added bonus of you're not making profit, you're just taking a fee, and that means you don't have to pay. This is what is new about this, right? I just want I mean, I, that's the. Yeah, that's the, I, I, that's I, what they say. Have you asked earlier about driving? That's the part. I, I haven't, to, obviously, right? like, like the rest of us, um, I haven't got any inside information as to what particular um, shenanigans, if you like, they, they're getting up to. But um, in the literature, um, we've got this example, right, because the, the, the government, the, the policy exchange and the CBI both argued for a change in the VAT regime. Mm -hmm. It's not ex precisely the way you described it, but it works in the following way. We take, for example, people living in a street, right? So shared milk service delivery can cut costs. You could therefore save yourself walking um, to, to the shop. Right? You get somebody come in a lot on, uh, driving a, a little milk van and delivering your milk could mean that it was a lower cost. Now, however, because you're paying for the service, right, it makes it actually 20% more expensive 
than going and buying it yourself. So, if you establish what is a special purpose vehicle, right? The name of a, basically it's a kind of company, right? It's a kind of company. Then actually, you can recover that twenty percent VAT, yeah. and that that really is is the mechanism. So, so in reality, what then happens? Is, is that um, you can only do that, you can only use a special purpose vehicle within a university if it is a shared service with another public sector um, a purchaser, which is why, the way I describe it in the, my analogy, you've got one street, right, and actually they're all made up of universities, and therefore there is no interest in any of the other universities in sharing your service because you're in competition with them. But on the other hand, down the road, there is a hospital. Right? They might like to have a milk delivery. If you, all you need, under the Tories' new proposal, all you need is to have a hospital say, we'll also buy that shared service, and then it becomes one on which you, through your special purpose vehicle, right, electrically um, driven, as you can see above, through, your, through that special purpose vehicle, you can then uh, be effectively exempt from VAT. Although it's not even as simple as that. Because the VAT right, has to arrive from somewhere. Right? What happens is, that, so, and this is the big question that I've got about whether, they, whether they've really, there's two things about it, whether they've finally fully worked it all out. In other words, um, Brian Roper, those of you who remember this illustrious name, used to spend a fraction of the VAT receipts they got back on those huge parties. Right? That's why he said that. So, so we, when, whenever we were filling in for them, we say, well, claim the VAT back, it was in order to get the VAT for those huge parties. Actually, right, in order, when you, if you're in a small business, as I was for many years, if you put in v VAT, Right? It, you, you're selling things and you add VAT on top. What is it that we're selling? Right? Where are we going to get the VAT right? to be able, you know, f from which money can be repaid for the special purpose vehicle? I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're, um, you know, if you're, if you're building a, a, a um, uh, if you're in a building site and you're making something, you're paying VAT all the time. And, and you're then selling, and you can claim back against your customer, the person who's buying the building. Where are we getting our VAT back from? What's the level of VAT that is actually being, being delivered by this university? It is not high. It is not high at all. So, the, so for me, there's still, there's a question, one, about their sums. How much VAT are they dangling in front of um, this particular competitor? Right? Um, or the second problem. Is is um, was 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 raised by the um, uh, there's an organisation of university um, IT uh, purchasers um, who had a seminar from the government last December and they they met they issued a report saying yeah we can see that an IT provider um, you know could actually sort of come in and. If we could get the VAT sorted, then they could claim the VAT back under the new measure. But the EU, whose whose income is derived by it's I think it's is it 0.5 uh, or is it one percent of all European VAT is provides the budget of the EU, right? So the EU is particularly interested in um, people making saying, okay, this is VAT exempt or the v VAT can be reclaimed. Will the EU um, enable this to happen? And so they said, they recommended their members, don't do this, wait until we find out whether or not the EU, once it's set up, whether the EU challenges it or not. And according to, to um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, you know, according to what I know, there, haven't, there has not yet been a final decision, a, a final verdict on whether it's actually legal. Now, the only, what, it, what it makes, it does make a difference. It makes a difference to, um, to the company, 
because they then are effectively being able to provide their services without mm -hmm. having to charge an additional 20% on cost. But if you look at that, all you're doing is saying, actually, it would cost the same as if we went down the, walked down the road to buy it. I mean, the service of having somebody come up and deliver it is what you're paying your VAT on. But if you do it yourself, you don't have that VAT to pay. So it's a saving for the company, it's an incentive for them, because they can then actually you know, get your business um, and make 20% just like that, provided you've got the VAT money to, 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 to give them back. But it's not, a, it's not at the moment, it's not, a, it's not a clear and it's not a done deal as far as I understand. Now, the, the business back management fee is not, is, not, is not the way that I've read any of the material about it so far. But um, it's, certainly, it's certainly an area which, which is, I mean, for me, we have a, a risk-taking management here. And that, that's the worry, that, you know, they, they, they talk about shared services, or it's the, 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 the truth, it's the way forward. Um, actually, they're taking a huge risk. Then they're taking a risk on the VAT, right? And we've seen them in this kind of, um, you know, mode in the past. And it, it's, it, for me, it's not what our university needs. I mean, you know, we don't need to have needless risks taken. I mean, we had risks taken last year with the over-recruitment. Hopefully this year we're going to be keeping a really, really tight, tight eye on that. But it is, it, you know, we don't need to have those risks taken. Okay, well we're about out of time, unless anybody's got any more questions. Any more questions? Okay, alright, thanks a lot Steve, that okay. was really interesting. And